Good morning, St. Lucia. My name is Malika Amide, and I would like to welcome everyone in this, listening to the sound of my voice, whatever platform you're listening on. We would like to welcome you to St. Lucia Queen's Commonwealth Essay Written Awards 2022. At this time, I'd like you to bow your head as we have a word of prayer. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, I want to thank you for bringing us all here today to witness greatness in the making. Thank you for blessing these participants in being brave enough to showcase their talent and give them the strength and the heart to encourage others to follow in their footsteps. Bless everyone here on this call and those who are on their way. Thank you, in Jesus' name we pray, amen. I would like now like to call on Michelle Samuel to give us a brief summary. Thank you very much, Melika, and good morning to each and every one of you. My name is Michelle Samuel, and I am the founder and president of Slit Terror which is the social enterprise which hosts this annual award ceremony for our St. Lucia Queen's Commonwealth essay writers. Now, just so that you know what this essay writing competition is about, I'll give you a bit of a history. The Queen's Commonwealth essay competition is the world's oldest international writing competition for schools established in 1883. Each year, young people are asked to write on a theme that explores the Commonwealth's values and principles, fostering an empathetic and open-minded worldview in the next generation of Commonwealth leaders. Recent themes have focused on the environment, inclusion, the role of youth leadership, and gender equality. Annually, winners are invited to travel to the United Kingdom for one week of educational and cultural activities, which culminates in a special award ceremony, very much like this one, usually held at Buckingham Palace. That is hosted by the society's vice patron, Her Royal Highness, the Duchess of Cornwall. Past winners, have gone on to become prominent leaders, including the Prime Minister of Singapore, Mr. Lee Hsien Yong, Pulitzer Prize winning journalist, Mei Fong, and the renowned author, Elspeth Huxley. Now, in 2022 this year, we have another competition coming up. And I do hope this is my first plug to ask those students watching, parents watching, principals and teachers, educators, ministers of government, to ensure and encourage that our young people participate in this year's competition. More information will be provided about that later on in the ceremony. Now, despite the significant interruption to children's education, caused by the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic. The 2021 competition saw a record level of participation. And I really look forward to even more young people around the Commonwealth entering the competition in 2022. Now, when I say the record number, I mean over 25,000 entries we received for last year. This is the highest number of entries ever. And of those entries, four of our St. Lucian students from various secondary schools across the island participated. And today, as part of the Nobel Laureate Festival for 2022, in collaboration with the Festival Committee, we are now recognizing these four amazing, phenomenal students who wrote on last year's theme. You will hear from them later on in the ceremony. But I would first like to go on the record by saying congratulations 
to those four students who we will hear from very soon. These four students are Ms. Azoya Howell of the SDA Academy, Ms. Latoya Murray of the Babano Secondary, Ms. Ayanna Paul of the Leon Hess Secondary, and Ms. Shanessa Joseph of the Viewfort Secondary School. Congratulations to each and every one of you. Congratulations to their parents and congratulations to their schools. These students have now put your schools and the education system of St. Lucia on the map. We need to continue to spark this fire so that it continues to ignite in the hearts of all of our students. It is important that we take note of all of the efforts that they have taken to put pen to paper and to express themselves on the issues that they face, though they may not share it verbally. When paper speaks, it is of utmost importance and it tends to speak the loudest. So we would just like to say, Thank you to these students for being so brave in doing this. As we celebrate excellence, facing new realities, creating new modalities, which is this year's St. Lucia Nobel Laureate Festival theme. We recognize you and we honor you this morning. Of course, we would like to say that though the ceremony was supposed to have been held in person, Due to unforeseen circumstances, especially with our ever rising COVID numbers, out of you know, regard for safety for our students, we decided to host this ceremony virtually. So we do apologize for those persons who may have registered in advance and of course RSVP'd to attend at the Finance Administrative Center. But where there is a will, there is a way. And God made a way so that even more of you could attend and be part of this ceremony. So this virtual platform really allows us to have even more of the public to see, to listen, and to learn what this ceremony is all about. This is the third, no, this is the fourth year that we are hosting this award ceremony for our students, Isla Terra. And we are so very grateful to the government of St. Lucia for their support in this initiative. We encourage them to continue to support us as we recognize our young writers every single year. We have a theme that we utilize when hosting this award ceremony. And this theme is a quest to find the next St. Lucian Nobel Laureate in literature. And we do believe that through this essay writing competition and others potentially, we may do just that. So enjoy the rest of the ceremony. Thank you so much for watching and for joining us this morning. And please listen as our students read their entries when that segment comes. Thank you very much. If, I think if I was the age, I'd be trying to write in that essay competition, you know, just to meet that queen, to meet the queen, sorry. Um, right now, I would like to call on Miss Paulina Murray from Song Tree, some brief remarks. A pleasant good morning to everyone. My name is Paulina Murray, co-founder of Songtree St. Lucia. We at Songtree, an organization which helps champion young persons by giving them a voice in the arts, a place to collaborate with Splatera on the occasion of the fourth annual St. Lucia Queen's Commonwealth Essay Awards during the St. Lucia Nobel Laureate Festival, which is being held under the theme, Celebrating Excellence, facing new realities, creating new modalities. Young writers, we celebrate your excellence, your contributions to our new realities and the modalities that you embody. 
We applaud and thank Sotero for the interest in our young people at the quest for finding another Derek Walker is found within your contributions to literature. Young people, Azora, Ayana, Lotoya, Shanessa, the power lies within you to make your dreams a reality. And I implore you to fly under the wings of Sir Derek and of course Sir Arthur so you can soar higher and find ultimate fulfillment. We celebrate you today. We want to celebrate your continuous, your continuous contributions as you face new realities. We want you to use the black genius, that black powers to help champion you so that the light you emit remains sparkly and the new modalities you create will be a pillar of a lifetime. I thank you and congratulations to you students. So with the Eagles, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Kalina. Kalina. Um, I wish that many other students, and I guess even those who are not students, who are willing to you know, undertake this journey of becoming a writer, could pair up with you, because I know you have done great things in the writing world. We will now have some remarks on the 2021 competition from our competition judge. Again, Ms. Michelle N. Samuel. Thank you very much, um, Malika. So as you know, the 2021 competition, as I stated, saw record-breaking numbers in terms of entries. But we need to know what exactly were these students writing about? What was the theme? What were the topics? What issues really sparked their interest so that even during this pandemic, even more students decided to speak out and put pen to paper? So in the 2021 theme was entitled community in the Commonwealth. But what does this really mean? With the global spread of COVID-19, we've seen lives of many Commonwealth citizens affected. However, through adversity, societies came together and stories of growth, community and hope continue to emerge. And there was nothing different about last year's competition. Now, there are usually two categories of the competition. There's the senior category that is for persons who were born between 1st July 2022, I'm sorry, 1st July and 30th June. So 1st July 20, 2002, sorry, and 30th June 2007. So these were persons 14 to 18 years of age. That is the senior category. And their topics were as follows. One, discuss the following. The greatness of a community is the most accurately measured by the compassionate action of its members. Again, listen carefully. The greatness of a community is most accurately measured by the compassionate actions of its members. You can think on those words and see if you agree with that. Topic two, keeping connected through COVID-19, something that we have strived to do. Topic number three, it's been 30 years since the end of COVID-19 pandemic. Oh my goodness. What does the world look like? And I'm sure you can notice, this is asking the students to think about this into the future and looking back at it as if it was in the past. Listen very carefully again. It's been 30 years since the end of the COVID-19 pandemic. Somebody's calling it into fruition. What does the world look like? And topic four, imagine you are the head of a Commonwealth nation heavily affected by the COVID-19 and giving a national address at the end of the pandemic, what would you say to your community? This, in my opinion, would have been the toughest one to write on, but we had 
some very courageous young people. In the junior category, these were students born on or after July 1st, 2007, under the age of 14. So yes, primary school students, this competition is open to you as well. And these were the topics. Number one, the year is 2050, and you've been asked to write about the coronavirus pandemic for a museum. What story would you tell? Again, looking at it as if it was past, and that's in the year 2050. Topic two, tell a story of how you or someone you know helped others during the pandemic. Topic three, we will be with our friends again. We will be with our families again. We will meet again. Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II, after the pandemic, you are seeing a friend for the first time. What new hobbies would you share with them? Interesting. And finally, what did you miss out most during the pandemic? Now, of course, our young primary school students would have missed out on a lot. Gathering with other friends, mingling at school, being able to play outdoors in their communities, being able to go to the beach, parties with their friends, birthday celebrations, all of this was taken away from them. And you could imagine the number of students who were impacted that had many words to say. And these were the topics that the students wrote on for last year's competition. And like I said, over 25,000 students put pen to paper to share their views on these specific topics, but also addressing and not forgetting the theme, community in the Commonwealth. And we all know what communities do. They work together, they look out for each other, and they rise again together, even after, if in case they fall. Now, the winners in terms of the senior and junior categories were chosen as um, overall gold winner and runner up. So there were four winners in each category. Those winners would have been brought to London for one week for educational and cultural events, culminating in a special award ceremony. A number of gold, silver, and bronze awards were distributed, as well as participating awards for everyone who participated in last year's competition. Now, I do believe, and I am of the firm belief, let me correct myself, that our young St. Lucian students can and will reach the top so that one or even more of them can visit Buckingham Palace and receive their award in the presence of Her Royal Highness and Majesty, the Duchess of Cornwall, and potentially meet the Queen. I do believe it is possible. So, students, Janessa, Ayana, Latoya, Azoya, and all of those watching right now, I have every confidence in you that you can do it. I am so proud of you that you took part this year. Don't give up, keep trying, keep writing. Even though the goal is not to win or may not be to win, your goal is to ensure that your voice and your words are heard by the masses. So once again, congratulations to the four of you. And I cannot wait to see what you produce for this year's competition. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Samuel. I would now like to welcome our published writer, Mrs. Monique Michelle, with some brief remarks. Hello, um, good morning, I must say. 
<laughs> Happy New Year to everyone who's on at the moment. And um, I just want you guys to relax. And uh, for the students who will be participating, I just want you guys to be, be yourself. It's not about big words. It's about the impact that you're about to have on the judges. And it's about how you, it's about how you grab attention. And as a published author, um, I have published over 10 books and it was not easy. I remember days when someone would tell me that, um, I remember being asked, are you even a writer? And I remember having this damn spirit, like, why would you even ask me that knowing that this is something that I love to do? Writing is an escape for me as a younger child. I, I, I can't give an age where I remember writing because to me, I've been writing all my life. And I remember when there were issues in my household or in my family, I would grab a book, I'll grab a pen or a pencil and I'll just write, I'll just write away. And the things that I used to write at that point were poems. But as I got older, the poems turned, um, turned into essays, the essays turned into research papers, the research papers turned into novels. And from the novels, yeah, I have, I have um, guidebooks and so forth. So I'm here to tell you, it's not about where you started and it's not about how, it's about you. It's all about you. And when you're, when you're um, choosing, when you're choosing a topic, I want it to not just be whole, a topic that my parents like, my, um, my motivator like, my advisor like, but something that you like. Because as young children or young adults, and you're going to represent your country, that representation starts with you. And when that representation starts with you, it starts from within right so you're going to choose something that you're comfortable with something that you know that you can deliver on and when you're going to deliver you're going to do it naturally and when it comes from the heart it's much much easier so i'm here today to tell you to just relax and just enjoy yourself while you write um from writing novels i started doing resumes application letters i do research papers and so forth for external people and you realize that before people think that, oh, in order for you to make it in the industry of writing, you know, you have to become a journal, um, a journalist or a reporter or something like that, when it's not really like that. You know, there are a lot of things that are coming up. You have people who need content writing now and stuff like that. So Entering this competition and starting here is to see your weak points and your strong points and to get there one day. I do hope that the winner is from St. Lucia. I've been to your country once and I must say it's beautiful and the people are even more beautiful. The smiles, the, the ambience and everything. So... I know you guys got it and I know you have that peace within and that happiness. Just shine, just be yourself and get it out there. This is my take. All right. Thank you. Thank you so much, Miss Monique. 10 books. Can you believe this? I wouldn't think I would have the heart to even publish those inner thoughts of mine or, you know, like she said, when hard times struck at home, that she, her passion became writing and been able to put her thoughts to paper. I don't know if I'll be able to do it, but like she said, people, be yourself, relax, and let it come from the heart. Thank you so very much. Now we'll have a video from the Royal Commonwealth Society.
We're not hearing it. We're having some technical difficulties. Could you just give us a moment, please? a century, this competition has positively affected so many people across the Commonwealth. Let's hear from some of them now. Hey, I'm Mei Fong, and I was one of the previous winners of the competition. Now, winning a prize really did change my life. I was born in Malaysia, and I was the fifth girl, and my father was a very traditional man who didn't believe in educating women too much. But he changed his mind a little bit after I won the competition and I was invited to meet the Queen of England and I brought him along. So since then I've won a Pulitzer, I've written powerful stories about women's rights and human rights and I've traveled the world. To this year's winners, all of you, I want to congratulate you and I want to tell you to keep on writing because it really will change your life and you can change the world. Hello, I'm Hia Chaudhary from India and I was the 2017 senior runner-up for the Queen's Commonwealth Essay Writing Competition. This competition changed my life in ways I earlier didn't imagine possible. It renewed my confidence in my work, honed my skills, gave me the experiences of a lifetime and inspired me to follow my dreams of becoming a writer. I'm Jodi from SVG and a supporter of the competition. It has been amazing to motivate the essential youths to develop their writing skills and support their creativity. My island's performance has grown from strength to strength to where it's fulfilling to know that one of this year's gold finalist awardees is from St. Vincent and the Grenadines. Thank you for allowing talented young people to use literacy as an empowering tool to become global citizens. Hello everyone, my name is Kenny Jamra and I'm from Ghana. I am a Queen's Commonwealth Essay Competition representative for Ghana. Over the years, I have promoted the essay competition, especially in rural communities in Ghana. This motivation came from the fact that as an educator, I have realized that many students in rural communities have creative abilities. They have the potential to contribute to our world but they were not exposed to a wonderful platform or opportunity like the essay competition. Through the essay competition, these young people have been able to express their creativity. They have been able to share some wonderful solutions that we can all incorporate in making our world a better place. So I'd like to ask each of you, what did you enjoy about the writing process? love about writing is how free it is. Like there's no right way or wrong way to do it. And it's just such a creative way for anybody to be able to express themselves without having to follow like a format or use a certain style. It's just really free for everybody to be able to write however they want, whatever they want to express their like personal opinions and feelings on certain topics that they might not be able to express any other way. And that's what I really like about writing. Cassandra. Um... It's you know what was absolutely brilliant about your writing. I felt like I already knew you before I even met you. I could hear your voice, your character. It was jumping off the page. It was, it was like, I am demanding to be heard. I, I need to be heard. I could feel the power in your words. They felt so strong and authentic. And that is, that is really, really formidable. And so well done you. you, you are actually, your piece is really saying what, uh, what I think is the power of writing. And so well done you. Thank you. <clears throat> I 
ever thought that writing could change the world, give you more confidence, send you on amazing journeys? I would like to take this time right now to reach out to our young men to let them know that they too can express themselves through writing. You just have to be yourself. There is power in writing. Right now, we would like to welcome our participants again, once again. And we're gonna take this time right now to listen to their reading entries. First off, we have Ms. Azoya Howell. Good morning. I am Azoya Howell of the St. Lucia Seventh Day Adventist Academy. I am a Form 4 student, and the topic which I wrote on was the national address after COVID. When we heard of that mysterious virus killing many in Asia, we thought nothing of it. We sort of played no mind. As the stories developed, there was a little bit of concern, but still not enough. The virus quickly spread to neighboring continents until it arrived here, our sweet and small St. Lucia. Ladies and gentlemen of my beloved St. Lucia, I am more than elated. The happiness that I am experiencing at this moment is inexplicable. It is over. The pain and despair, the panic and confusion is all over. The coronavirus, gone. The first case caught us all by surprise. It seemed that the virus would never get here, and somehow it did. But we were not of much concern because it was just a foreigner who came and went straight into quarantine. Nothing major, right? Most of us continued with our don't care attitude and lived carelessly, not putting any protocols into practice. Although advised, no protocols were established at parties, weddings, or other social events. Nothing bad could happen, could it? The second case came along and there still wasn't enough concern, but it was that third case that drew out some fear. Schools were closed, businesses began making schedules and protocols were being upheld. The cases grew slowly, but very steadily. Things began getting more and more serious. Then our biggest fear became a reality, community spread. Cases began to rise more rapidly through the communities, demanding a lockdown. The pronouncement of this lockdown caused much pandemonium outside supermarkets and wholesale retailers. Everybody wanted to get all the essentials for their households to last the duration of the lockdown. Things got so bad that items had to be rationed in order for everyone to be able to buy. As cases grew more and more, a state of emergency was implemented along with curfews of different times. These curfews, like the lockdown, were not adhered to by every single citizen and cases continued to rise even more rapidly. More and more curfews were implemented in an attempt to keep the cases under control. During all of this chaos, jobs were lost and businesses were closed. Our economy was greatly affected. A lot of employers didn't know where they would get the money to give out paychecks, nor did employees know when or if they would receive. Both the private and public sectors were compromised by this pandemic. Mental health of students depleted. Stress levels of parents rose as they tried teaching their children at home. We all tried to keep our heads above water as we waited and prayed this pandemic out. But it is finally over. We are now COVID free and it is time for us to bounce back. It is time for us to get back on our feet and don't ever let the force of gravity help us down. My administration and I will be with you every step of the way, but we should all remember to be our brothers and sisters keepers. 
Always give a helping hand and never be afraid to ask for one. We are all in this together, holding on to each other for balance. Don't ever let go of your partner. Kudos to every single citizen of this nation. You never give up. True resilience has been shown through this pandemic. Now, it is time to put that resilience into getting back up on our feet and staying there. As we explore normalcy, I pray that God keeps, blesses you and bestows all his love and protection upon you and your families. I thank you. Thank you so much for that, Miss Howell. I was so wild, I didn't even realize she was done. I wanted to hear much more. Our next participant will be Latoya Mure from the Babuna Secondary School. Good morning, I'm Latoya Mure and I'm a Form 3 student of the Babuna Secondary School. My entry is entitled, It has been 30 years since the end of the COVID-19 pandemic. What does the world look like? Greetings to all citizens of the earth. I am Ukohola Gwen, former secretary of the World Health Organization, WHO. My reminiscence began in a wonderful world where everyone had freedom of movement and people were not restricted from each other. After all, we are social beings. I was sitting at my desk preparing for a meeting when messengers stated that a new virus had hit the world. I did not think of it as anything serious as I was asked to release the statement to the world on January 12, 2020, that a novel coronavirus was the cause of a respiratory illness in a cluster of people in Wuhan city, Hubei province, China, who had initially come to the attention of the WHO on 31st December, 2019. This cluster was initially linked to the Humana Seafood Wholesale Market in Wuhan City. However, some of those first cases with laboratory confirmed results had no link to the market. And the source of the epidemic is unknown. COVID-19 is said to be the name of the pneumonia-like disease that is causing a devastating global pandemic. According to the South China Morning Post, the virus has quickly sparked and, one of, and is one of the largest behavior changes. Wow, a global health emergency had hit the world of God. I thought to myself after releasing the report, people thought that it was a regular virus like the common flu or smallpox, but it just would not go away. The virus proved to have had a lot of ill effects of the world and its citizens. Millions of people all over the world who contracted the virus went to the graves because there was no cure for the virus. The implemented of face masks, social distancing, and lockdowns all over the world brought darkness on the face of the, our planet. Emotional, economic, physical, and social arrest brought about crime, frustration, fear, and more poverty to us here on Earth. COVID-19 made the tourism industry very fragile, and we can agree that at the time, millions of people worked in the tourism industry. Millions of children were stressed and aggravated in learning how to use the online platform, as well as parents as such became the norm. People were dying like flies, with no burial places to put them. Various organizations became hospitals, and many persons committed suicide. I'm a recovery patient from the virus, and to tell you the truth, the pains in my joints, fever within, sweating, and inability to breathe on my own has taught me to buy a life and be thankful to be alive. I took the corona vaccine, which was made to control the spread of the virus, along with many other citizens of the earth. I can safely say the coronavirus was the most significant threat to humanity since the World War III. It has been 30 years since the end of the COVID-19 pandemic. It has been 30 years since the coronavirus has been extinct. And as I sit here in my rocking chair, old and gray, and look back on the world, I can safely say, welcome to a technologically advanced world. Fasten your seatbelts as I take you on a journey to a brand new life. The surface of the earth glows in majesty. There have been significant changes to the face of the world. The world is a better place for the entire human race. It is a it is just a whole new world. 
technological advancements such as only electric vehicles, electric water vessels contribute to the decrease of air pollution, decrease to human-like asthma, pneumonia, pulmonary disease, and tuberculosis. It is now prime to smoke in public spaces and be drunk. Poverty has decreased due to the elevation of health issues. The rich soil produces fruits that are no longer plagued with diseases, but just good for eating. The agriculturists of our time have implemented the use of only natural manure for vegetation. The earth is a virgin pride, adorned for a husband. Geothermal energy is used worldwide. Our children enjoy the benefits of face to face learning, and there is no longer a need to wear a face mask. Tourism is now at the top of its game, and tourists can enjoy a vacation in paradise. The streets are as clear as pure gold, fire, tired in the fire. Animals graze in the green grass and drink from the clear streams. The changes that we have seen in the past 30 years since the coronavirus have increased to the value of Earth, our planet, our home. Earth can now boost off a pollution-free atmosphere where flowers blossom, plants illness is less, people worry less and talk to elevate climate change is no longer significant like it used to be. Countries are developing like small islands, developed states like St. Lucia, less, as less money is spent on healthcare. The ocean is not drying up like it used to. Fishermen, however, have a consistent good catch of fish. I have given you a clear snapshot of planet Earth, and now I close my eyes into a deep sleep. I thank you. Thank you so much for that. Can we just fast forward to that vision of hers? Do you hear how brilliant our young people's minds are? Let's continue to encourage writing people. We will now go to our third participant, Miss Latoya, sorry, Miss Lana Paul from the Leon Hair Secondary School. Good day, everyone. I am Liana Paul and I attend the Leonis Comprehensive Secondary School. The title of my entry is, Imagine you are the head of a, com a Commonwealth nation heavily affected by COVID-19 and given a national address at the end of the pandemic. What would you say to your community? Greetings to you, my fellow Sinotians. Today is a great day for the community of Goshan. I stand here today, saddened by the alarming daily headlines that flooded, and saddened our newsstands. Grateful for the lessons taught by COVID-19, but most of all, elated that it has finally ended. COVID-19 almost sent us into extinction. It was a scary time for a lot of us here today and the thousands of people who transmitted from the earth to the grave because of its venom. Before I go any further, let me applaud you for the faith in believing that we could make it through this pandemic, but most of all, for being willing to adjust your lifestyles to suit this pandemic. I am sorry that nothing prepared us for this crisis that swept us away like autumn leaves. This was a dark time for all of us in some way. And I sympathize with you, with those of you who lost loved ones or your jobs. I know that, I know that no amount of sympathy can bring your loved ones back, but let me assure you that this too shall pass. Your resilience said that we can make it through this pandemic and we did it. It is over my people. Now is the time for a rebirth. And I solicit your cooperation and willingness as we rebuild this nation and our community together. You see, as a leader, a father, a spouse, and a friend, this pandemic has affected me and you in many ways. But I thank God that he did not allow this pandemic to warp us. Many precautions were taken during the last six years of our lives, like social distancing, wearing a mask, sanitizing of the hands, and of course, 
the curfews. I restricted you so much. I thank you, the healthcare workers, frontliners, teachers, government ministers, the policemen, firemen, and everyone for your service during these dark times. I thank you for your patience, courage, and understanding. This pandemic is end, has ended, and there is a great calling for our community, our nation. COVID-19 had a lot of ill effects on us as people. It dried up our economy, putting big holes in our tourism sector and diminish the, the working class. Our educational sec sector suffered as our children had to be kept home and be forced to adopt a new style of learning, far from the norm, which was a virtual learning. A lot of our students did not have access to devices because their parents could not afford. Many of you have been affected due to, to, due to the closure of the tourism industry, with which a lot of citizens working here and abroad lost their jobs. We had to make sacrifices and adopt new practices to protect ourselves and our loved ones. Many persons took their own lives because they could not cope with this pandemic. It was just too much for them to handle. The rise of crime and violence skyrocketed because of the financial and emotional pressure on the economy. I continue to extend my condolences and sympathies once again with all the families that were affected by this COVID-19 pandemic. Our children are still broken. We are in the process of rehabilitation. We must move on. We face many trials, but no, this everyone. We will get through this together. We made it. Yes, you and I. We did it together. Sunny days will come. But first, we need to put our heads together to work for the reboot of our community. We need to keep our nation in prayers, work hard to heal the scars of COVID-19. And please do your part faithfully as this new time has dawned on us. Yes, it is the end of the pandemic, but the beginning of our rebirth. We still have a long way to go as a community. I thank you again for your understanding, patience and faithfulness to our community. I am working tirelessly to do whatever I can to help alleviate the problem you face. Let us join hand in hand to build a stronger community. I thank you again and God bless you. Wow. We are all waiting for this address. I know I am, are you? But one thing that I think COVID actually did is to get so many young writers out. And I think it did a good thing. Nonetheless, we wish it was gone. We will now go on to, first I'd like to apologize that Miss Shanessa Joseph wouldn't be able to join us live. So we will now listen to a recording of her video. A recording of her reading, sorry. My name is Nessa Joseph from the River Conferences Secondary School, and my piece is entitled 30 Years Ahead Post COVID Living. Mommy, I need help choosing a topic for my history essay. Okay, do you have any ideas? Zena, my 16 year old daughter, began listing topics which she had brainstormed earlier, but I was unimpressed as all of these topics were stereotypical and overused. I dislike all of these, I said dissatisfied. She seemed disappointed, but I quickly uplifted that expression as I suggested a topic she seemed to have been fascinated by. Your topic would be the COVID-19 pandemic. Her previously ardent expression quickly turned to one of confusion as she realized she knew little to nothing about the topic I suggested. It's okay, I reassured her. I lived through it. I will help you. Your research question would be, what does the world look like 30 years after the COVID-19 pandemic? 
Sounds good? Zena agreed. I need to think of my rationale too. My teacher explained that the rationale is the objectives of the essay. I need at least three of them, and I think my first one should be to describe the impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic on different industries and sectors. I could tell Zena was getting tired, so I encouraged her to think of a second objective for her rationale before she went to bed. She would tell me what she thought of tomorrow afternoon when she arrived home from school. Good night, mom, she murmured, as she sleepily walked up the stairs into her bedroom. I giggled and replied good night. Earlier the next morning, Zena rushed into my bedroom enthusiastically as she prepared for school. I came up with two more objectives, she said. The first one is to examine the innovations developed to mitigate the impacts of the pandemic. And the second one is to determine how the pandemic influenced the progress made in these industries. Still exhausted and slightly annoyed at being woken up before the sun, I sluggishly nodded and told her we would improve them when she gets back home from school. She agreed and bolted out of my bedroom. How did she have so much energy so early in the morning? That afternoon, Zena raced back into the house from the school with equal eagerness as this morning and immediately summoned me from the kitchen to work on her SB. If you couldn't tell already, history was Zena's favorite subject. She could go on for eons discussing historic events and the people if she had to. After composing her rationale, Zena was ready to gather the needed information. I first asked her, what are some conveniences or luxuries you take advantage of every day? After much thinking, she responded, well, I have a flexible school schedule. I don't have to take tests periodically because my teacher's AI assistant analyzes my performance throughout the school year. I get to learn through virtual reality and because I get amazing grades, I get to finish school faster. From the stories you've told me, these luxuries didn't exist back then. She scribbled notes as she went on and on. You are correct, they did not. It's amazing how we've been able to flip the education system upside down and demolish the listen and learn experience in the classroom. I had to do what I was told, as I was told, and we were graded off of that. The force in the education system back then really came to light when school was moved to a virtual platform because the pandemic was at its peak. Both teachers and students were struggling to adjust. School for students quickly became only about passing and not actually learning. It's nice to see that since then, changes have been made so that every student can experience the joys of learning. Now think again for a while. What are some other sectors or industries that come to mind? She was thinking for what seemed like a decade, but eventually she responded, aviation. Being a flight attendant, I've witnessed the growth of the aviation industry firsthand. Airplanes keep getting bigger and better every day. It's almost scary. Even though I already knew what she would answer, I proceeded to ask her to describe the aviation industry anyway. Um, she began thinking of what she would say. Airplanes have several amenities, such as bars and lounge areas that make the flying experience super comfortable and relaxing. I encouraged her to think harder. I giggled as she pointed out what, to her, were flaws in the industry, but I explained to her that it wasn't structured like that previously. Firstly, there were not so many amenities on a plane, but now they're like mini hotels in the sky. They've done all this while still accommodating maximum capacity of passengers. Secondly, traveling was more expensive, but service was free. The cost of traveling were redirected from booking the flight to in-flight services because during the pandemic, airlines lost out on a lot of profit because of the economic situation of the world. They've reinvented the industry to become immune to a global economic recession if it were to happen again. Now that you see where I'm going with this, name another industry that you think has made much progress over the past 30 years. Hmm, the medical industry. I was hoping you would pick that. Remember when they inserted something into my arm at the doctor's office? Did I ever tell you what it was for? No, you didn't. Well, what they inserted was a diagnostic sensory device. 
It's a fairly recent medical discovery. This piqued Zena's interest, and her face scrunched up in confusion, but slowly reverted to normalcy as she began to understand how the device worked. It came about as a result of what we refer to as quarantine. During the pandemic, people who may have been exposed to the virus had to quarantine for a period of time before getting tested. During that time, they were given a patch that they would stick on their skin, most commonly the chest area, to track their vitals and detect symptoms of the virus. Doctors soon started thinking about how they could apply the same concept on a wider scale for everyday use. Oh, so the diagnostic sensory device tracks your vitals and lets you know when you're sick? Something like that. It indeed tracks my vitals, such as my heartbeat and blood pressure. Whenever the device detects abnormalities, it makes me very drowsy to alarm me. I also mentioned that the reason for this device is to make diagnoses by doctors quicker, easier, and more accurate. It also helps with case studies because the device provides concrete, real-time data for medical workers to use. It has helped with case studies considerably and is the reason scientists and doctors were able to make a cure for cancer after decades of trying. So how does it work? Zena inquired, quite intrigued. <coughs> medical workers came up with internationally recognized codes for medical conditions, and the device is programmed to match any abnormal vitals it may detect with the codes of the medical condition it thinks you may suffer from. It's not always accurate, but that's okay, because the doctor always makes the final diagnosis. The device's diagnosis and records are simply an aid. I just had to go and get one implanted too. Zena indicated to me that she had enough information. I decided to give her a final piece of advice. Dramatically, I cleared my throat like I was about to give a speech and told her, we are in the era where problem solving and innovative thinking is at its peak. Honestly, I don't think we would have reached so far in so little time if the pandemic didn't force us to realize the importance of technology and how to use it more efficiently. If there's anything else you need help with, you know where I'll be. Proudly, after some cherished and much needed mother-daughter bonding, I watched Zena slowly disappear upstairs to her bedroom to write what I knew would be an impressive research paper. Wow. And I'll keep saying it. Wow. COVID is definitely one for the history books. The way she drew us into her storytelling using mother and daughter scenarios, that's quite a different tone. I'm still wow. <laughs> I want to be in those eras, those times of no more COVID. Okay, um, <clears throat> now. Um, I would like to say that the presentation of certificates and awards will be done at a later date with the students, because I think it would be best if we have them in person. I would love to meet those young ladies one-on-one. -on -one. We will now have some brief remarks from Michelle and Samuel. Thank you very much, Mylika. And I will share your sentiments in saying, wow. All of our students really proved that when they speak, they speak truth. And sometimes they see things for a different lens that we as the adults cannot see and just refuse to see in some cases. Using their imaginations to address these issues, bravo to each and every one of you. This is me saying bravo to you and I know that our listening and viewing audience is applauding you as well. Now, after you have heard these four students, it is only fair for me to say that they have really made me see that the written word is not dead. The written word is alive in our young people. They are writing they are speaking and they are expressing. Now in this awards ceremony that we've held for the past four years, we have come across a number of young writers, one of which really, really piqued our interest in terms of the quality, the method, the strategy 
that she used in her writings. Many of you may have known her through one way or another, whether it would be through her YouTube channels, whether it would be through her published work, whether it be through her participation as a member of Girls of a Feather. But this young lady is known across the region for her writing skills. And she was one of our participants for a number of years. I say was, because unfortunately, she has passed the age range for competing, which is why she did not compete last year. This young writer is now overseas studying a degree on a scholarship. But before she left the island, she left with us her written word. But not just written, she left with us a spoken word. Now, though we are celebrating our last year's participants, I think it would be remiss of us to not make mention and recognize and say an official farewell to one of our past writers and past winners. I am speaking of none other than Ms. Khadija Halliday. Ms. Khadija Halliday has written pieces from 2018 to 2020. And as a farewell from us here at Slaterra to Khadija and the partnership with Songtree, we will now share with you Khadija's entries from the year 2018 to 2020. Please take note of her techniques in her writing. And I leave to you to decide whether this young woman may just be on the track to be our next Nobel Laureate in Literature. We will share each of her entries via video as she would have recorded them at Calabash TV. And I would just like to say thank you to Calabash TV for assisting us in this video recording of Khadija Halliday's entries. And now we commence with 2018's entry from Khadija Halliday. Hello, my name is Khadija Halliday, and this is the piece that I submitted for the 2018 Queen's Commonwealth Essay Competition. The title is The Road to a Safer Future. I believe that the road to a safer future is not paved with pretentious pronouncements. Neither is it laid by the passing of new laws, nor the skyscraping of highways of new leaders cemented in public pretenses. I believe that we have spent centuries cruising along the sidewalk to the road that leads to a safer future, pulverizing innocent pebbles, capsizing free-thinking flowerpots, yelling antagonistic apologies for the dirt left behind. I believe that on the road to a safer future, it is ironic increasingly so that we focus the majority of our energy on the external commotion of traffic, the colors of the paints that color each vehicle continuously choosing to disregard the blatant fact that we all innately carry the exact same fuel. I believe that the lone pedestrians trudging along at the edge of the road to a safer future are judged by their poverty and seldom by the vehicles that we rob from them by our reluctance to offer a ride. I believe that we religiously regard the tracks of white and yellow marks positioned strategically along the road, not recalling it seems to erase the umbilical blueprints from past constructors and trace into the road our own. I believe that these are the century-old propensities that protect the erroneous allegation of the unattainability of a safer future. Evidently, it shows that the issue in fact is not inconsistency, but precisely its exact opposite, consistency, a repeated repetition of the exact same concession along the road. I believe with utmost conviction that the renovation of our routine sensitive mindsets is the only avenue to gaining ground on the road to a safer future. Habitually, we address the carelessness of the drivers and seldom the stained windshields from which they look through. Mind you, on a day-to-day -day basis, generations of mentalities are pre-molded and marred in advance as per fault of the routine-based confines of the past. The roads are safe for future. Psh, I believe that we misinterpret the signs at its sides. 
for instance, the ones that read stop, we completely crop out of our vision because we automatically associate stop with the direction for permanent delay when all it really is is a prompt for a moment of reflection so that we can learn from our ways. I believe that we readily embrace the word shortcut because we refuse to grasp that it's just an illusion, non-existent and directly deceiving. And in the end, when we finally see it for what it really is, we take no blame and incriminate an innocent road for the dismal products of our own poor decision making. I believe that the accidents and collisions that we get into along the road to a safer future are too hastily cleaned up, preventing us from absorbing the implications of the acts of speeding and disobedience and overtaking. I believe that the thousands of tragedies occurring at roundabouts aren't mere coincidences because it's at these roundabouts that we all exit from varying backgrounds and experiences and situations and we've never been sufficiently taught to exhibit patience and understanding at such intimate intersections. I believe that we seldom adhere to the rules of the road because no one has ever sat us down and embedded the magnitudes of the fines issued as a result of rebellion and deviation. I believe that we crash into lampposts and tumble into traffic lights because we harbor the innate toddler-like tendency to topple off course even in the presence of light and clear direction. I believe that the most glaring and underrated sources of light are the lampposts located at the very beginning of the road to a safer future in the form of innocence and curiosity and hope. I believe that these lights are the lights that we shield our eyes to because we've all been darkened by the tar coating this road and the introduction of light to darkness now would be scary and unfamiliar and frightening. I believe that the real reason we fly nuclear obscenities out through the windows of our vehicles is not because we harbor hate for our fellow drivers but because we aim to conceal the insecurity and lack of control we feel over the wheel. I believe that the real reason we wind our windows down to patronize passing drivers is not because they have persecuted us in any way, but because we all have this quiet embedded fear that by the time we find the safer future, our engines will be empty and our tanks bare. I believe that we each grow up promising to change things when we're old enough to reach the wheel and that finally, when we are old enough, we forget those past dreams. I believe that the scratches and nicks we receive taint us more than we can see and that no amount of paint can erase them, but at least we can still believe. I believe that on this road, on this journey to safety, we are never going to unanimously agree. I believe that we will all always drive at different speeds, but I believe that the ratio, irrespective of individual belief or hierarchical seat or driving speed, is eternally equivalent to potential and promise. I believe that the way we process the tickets we receive mentally is the key to driving more patiently in the future. And I believe most of all that we can't all expect to fit into one lane. Logically, it's impossible. But eventually, all individual lanes will lead to one junction called a safer future. Hello, my name is Khadija Halliday and I attend Sir Arthur Lewis Community College. This piece that I'm about to perform was the piece that I submitted to last year's 2019 Annual International Queen's Essay Commonwealth Competition. The topic that I chose was Family, Community, Nation, Commonwealth. What are our opportunities for shared sustainable growth? The title of my piece is I am tiny but I am hope. Hope, get down from there. I startle and look up at Mama for a bit. Merely grinning toothily, I decide to not listen. I continue in my attempts to climb the mountainous front desk, my hands making somewhat of a sticky mess on the walls of the desk as I do so. This most definitely isn't the first time that I am attempting to climb this front desk. We visit the hospital frequently. And yes, each time I giggle as the desk groans upon my arrival, but I don't think it really minds. The lady at the front desk sure doesn't. Neither does Mama. She stops me when she realizes that I'm about to hurt myself. Usually, that is. Sometimes when she's busy filling out piles of papers or talking to the lady at the front desk or arguing in hushed tones over the phone, I fall. But I'm learning. And all consequences have actions. 
That's what Mama says as she hurriedly, with a protective gentleness, dusts me off and blows a raspberry on my cheek. I don't mind the learning. Even in those moments when salty rivulets are trickling down the rise of my cheeks, I am tiny, but I am big. And that's why I continue to climb. Hope Commonwealth. This, however, brings me to a halt. Commonwealth is my second name, but Mama only uses it when she needs me to listen. Mama doesn't wait for me to get down on my own. She swoops in and carries me away from whatever danger she believes I was in. The sudden whooshing movement tickles my insides and escapes in the happy form of bubbles of laughter. Mama looks down sternly at me, but her right side of her face too tickles with young laughter. That's enough learning for today, she decides, but not with any harshness. I am not upset. I understand that Mama wants the best for me, and that Mama has to protect me, and that Mama named me Hope first, because that is what I am first to her. Hope. Miss Nation, the lady at the desk calls. Mama immediately looks up to her name and gifts the lady with a smile, as we are given the indication to head on. Mama's soft smile probably seems soothing to the lady, but I feel the strain of it. Mama takes my sticky hand in hers, completely unbothered by the sticky mess I'm making. Together, we walk. By now, my own two feet know the path by heart, but Mama never lets go of my hand. Mama never lets go. Mom, Mama greets quietly as we meet Grandma in the next waiting room. I can feel my face stretching to beam as Grandma opens her large, beckoning arms wide for me. I rush in eagerly, albeit clumsily, but she stabilizes me. Grandma stabilizes me. Despite having taken my first steps a few years ago, Grandma insists that I'm still learning to walk. Mama agrees with her. I want to as well, but I'm still understanding. Grandma hugs like a community. That's what Mama says. And Mama's smart, real smart. She has her own stethoscope, and it's real. Not like the toy ones I have, I swear. But Mama says that none of her smartness matters. In fact, Mama says that sometimes she doesn't feel so smart, in less kind words when she's speaking to Grandma alone and thinks that I can't hear. It doesn't matter that she's Dr. Nation at her fancy meetings, the ones in which she dresses up in her fancy suits that she lets me wear sometimes for fun. Mama says that none of that matters. Her true safety net is her mom, and Grandma hugs like her community. So it makes sense to me. I love Mama, her smartness and her protecting me, but I also love and need what Mama got, Grandma, the warm, yummy feeling that her hugs give. I need that feeling. As we approach the familiar giant door, Grandma pauses for the tiniest bit before touching the doorknob. It's tiny, but I notice it. I'm tiny, but I notice things. Grandma looks at me and softens her face teasingly sticking out her tongue at me. I giggle and stick my own out. But behind me, Mama's shallow breathing reminds me of what Grandma is trying to distract me from. They think they're protecting me. They don't want to expose me to the scary monsters of the world. I'm tiny, but I think. And I think that I need to meet the scary monsters now so that I can grow up understanding what I need to kill. I'm tiny, but I think. We enter, and we see her, family. When I was even tinier than I am now, Mama had tried to explain the concept of a great-grandmother. Mama tried so hard to explain how she fit in the family. Hearing that word repeated so often, I called her just that, family. And yes, I'm old enough now, but family is what I've always known. Mama and Grandma used to be amused by this, but now they too sometimes slip and call her family. I'm frightened as I gaze at her body, connected to the machines that I don't know any of the names to. And there's a lot. I look at Mama, but she turns away, realizing that I'm staring at the lone rivulet trickling down her face. I wish she wouldn't. I'm tiny, but I need to know. I look at Grandma. I need to know, I try to tell her. I need to know the pain of all the generations that gave birth to me. She understands a bit more than Mama. She allows me to gaze at, no, no, her own rivulets of tears before she crumples and has to turn away. I'm tiny, but 
I'm beginning to understand. Looking back at the bed, I approach family. I stare at her barely their hands. I had never seen them with my eyes, but I know grandma has albums. Family used to be big, not chubby like me, massive. Her hands are barely there now, and her body is still, but her hands are shaking. Her hands occasionally twitch as she attempts to stop the shaking. Her attempts are familiar. I'm tiny, but I too shake sometimes. For example, when mama's busy, never when she's looking. I want to make her proud. I want to make grandma proud too. I'm the hope, but I too shake sometimes. I'm tiny, but I'm strong. Family's now tiny too, but no longer strong. My still somewhat sticky hands hug hers. Her hand hugs closer. Some of my quiet shaking becomes louder while some of hers quiets. Are we both now shaking or are we sharing? Her hand hugs tighter. My hands do too. The sticky mess of my hand doesn't bother her. She's family and we need family. Mama says I'm tiny but I am the future. Maybe, but we need family for the future. I can't let family die. I'm tiny, but without families, my name means nothing. There are no opportunities for shared growth. I won't let family die. Her eyes open and immediately mine play hide and seek. Because I'm tiny, but all of a sudden, I'm heavy. Heavy by the hurt I see swarming through the broken irises of family. Stories of the past, stories happening. I see mothers leaving and fathers drinking and children coping. I see pain. I see a lifetime of families breaking. I see a century of families losing families. I see families ending. I see how my family is ending. Her hand tightens around my hand. I thought we had shared all that we could, but I was wrong. I am tiny and I am wrong. I can't know all the pain of yesterday, even though I try. I want to make tomorrow better, but there's too much history. Is mama right to turn away when she cries? Is grandma curing us a little when she hugs? Family doesn't know, neither do I. But this lack of answers is something we share. This search for answers is what we share. Family's hurting, and I'm not deaf to the stifled sobs from behind me, and I'm not ignorant to my innocence. But though I'm tiny, I hoot. I gaze into family's eyes. Her broken irises are coming together again. They're reflecting something. They don't have their own light. They're borrowing a light? What are you reflecting, family? Hope, she whispers. This is all I think about as we leave. Mama holding tightly onto my hand as the lady at the desk says, have a good day, Miss Nation and grandma hugging me like a community. As we pass it, I look back at the tall but no longer formidable height of the counter. I know I'll be back. And now family knows it too. I will climb again. I'm tiny, but I'm hope. Mama smiles softly down at me, hearing me mumble my name sleepily. Hope Commonwealth. My name is Khadija Halliday. I am a recent Sir Arthur Lewis Community College graduate. The topic that I chose for this year's competition was There is no Planet B. How will climate change affect you and your community? The title of my piece is Our only Planet B is a failed Planet A. This piece is a reverse poem, which means when I read it the first way, it's going to have one meaning, but then when I reverse it and read it the other way around, line by line, it will have a completely different meaning. So please pay attention to the end. Is a failed planet A our only planet B? The simple truth is that climate change is not a real issue for today. Only the delusional dare to declare that we absolutely have to change the way we live now. Such falsehoods are nothing more than fairy tales. The fate of the future primarily depends on only the people of the future. 
No blame belongs to the people of the present. It is completely unacceptable to say the opposite. Without an unwavering doubt, it is far more worthwhile doing the following, that is, just focusing on the problems we cause only if they affect us today, and just trusting that our children will handle the residue of our decisions all by themselves tomorrow. Imagine the sheer cruelty of depriving ourselves of maximum wealth for the sake of the maximum health of other lives besides our own. We should be thinking realistically. For the sake of the maximum quality of life for our humanity, it is imperative we understand that survival is selfishness. Or in other words, to survive is to be selfish. How can one think that a Garden of Eden can be possible without the exile of half of Adam and Eve? Of course not. Tell me, is it misguided to believe that everything must come at a cost? And that in this particular case, the earth just has to be that cost? And that this is simply the way the rule works? In spite of this known truth, the stubborn will still contest this by insisting that some rules are meant to be broken. Well, it's too bad for them that everything coming at a cost is the superior rule of life. Not one person can counter otherwise. Experts say that there will come a time. Some islands will not survive the increased sea levels, some species will not survive the increased global warming, and some people will not survive the increased epidemic occurrence. Sadly, but certainly, significant success is never without significant sacrifice. Significant expansion is never without significant annihilation. If you are not going to comprehend this and contemplate the bigger picture, it is just plain ignorant for you to insist that for absolutely no good reason, entire ecosystems and biomes and habitats are suffering without worthy cause and without noble purpose and without clear intention. How could anyone agree to such nonsense? Isn't our ideal standard of living the result of all this destruction? It is frustrating that there is still so much resistance to this obvious truth. Be part of the right revolution. We shouldn't fight for the animals like they are equals, and fight for the trees like they won't grow back, and fight for the unborn like they are already born. Blind dreamers, not big dreamers, dare to believe wholeheartedly that preservation of the environment is preservation of all humanity. This is just naivety, not hope, but hopelessness. It is impractical to trust in our capacity for change. Too many of us keep miscalculating the trauma we ensue in the name of advancement, while severely understating our planet's ability to heal itself. We put too much unrealistic trust in our conscience and our morals and our humanity. We must never compromise maximum advancement for our race. We should not be in any kind of confusion about this. Why is there still so much ignorance? We need to forget about being sustainable and concede to the principle survival of the fittest. It is mindless to say things like, to remember we are not the only human is to ensure that we stay human. Progress always trumps collateral, especially if collateral means the fate of people who don't yet exist. Undoubtedly, it is just absurd to believe that the term humanity incorporates everyone, including those who are not yet born. This is the simple truth. Now I shall read the poem the other way around, and it will have a completely different meaning. This is the simple truth. The term humanity incorporates everyone, including those who are not yet born. Undoubtedly, it is just absurd to believe that progress always trumps collateral, especially if collateral means the fate of people who don't yet exist. To remember we are not the only human is to ensure that we stay human. It is mindless to say things like, we need to forget about being sustainable and concede to the principle survival of the fittest, so much ignorance. Why is there so confusion about this? We should not be in any kind of race for maximum advancement. We must never compromise our conscience and our morals and our humanity. We put too much unrealistic trust in our planet's ability to just heal itself while severely understating the trauma we ensue in the name of advancement. Too many of us keep miscalculating our capacity for change. It is impractical to trust in hopelessness, but not hope. This is just naivety. Big dreamers, not blind dreamers, dare to believe wholeheartedly that preservation of the environment is preservation of all humanity. Shouldn't we fight for the animals like they are equals, and fight for the trees like they won't grow back, and fight for the unborn like they are already born? 
be part of the right revolution. It is frustrating that there is still so much resistance to this obvious truth. The result of all this destruction is not our ideal standard of living. How could anyone agree to such nonsense? Without clear intention and without noble purpose and without worthy cause, entire ecosystems and biomes and habitats are suffering for absolutely no good reason. If you are not going to comprehend this and contemplate the bigger picture, it is just plain ignorant for you to insist that significant success is never without significant sacrifice and that significant expansion is never without significant annihilation. Sadly, but certainly, there will come a time some islands will not survive the increased sea levels, some species will not survive the increased global warming, and some people will not survive the increased epidemic occurrence. Experts say that everything coming at a cost is the superior rule of life. Not one person can counter otherwise. Well, it's too bad for them that some rules are meant to be broken. In spite of this known truth, the stubborn will still contest this by insisting that everything must come at a cost and that in this particular case, the earth just has to be that cost and that this is simply the way the rule works. Tell me, is it misguided to believe that a Garden of Eden can be possible without the exile of half of Adam and Eve? Of course not. How can one think that to survive is to be selfish or in other words, survival is selfishness? Thinking realistically, for the sake of the maximum quality of life for our humanity, it is imperative we understand that we should be depriving ourselves of maximum wealth for the sake of the maximum health of other lives besides our own. Imagine the sheer cruelty of just trusting that our children will handle the residue of our decisions all by themselves tomorrow, and just focusing on the problems we cause only if they affect us today. Without an unwavering doubt, it is far more worthwhile doing the following, that is, the opposite. It is completely unacceptable to say no blame belongs to the people of the present, only the people of the future. Such falsehoods are nothing more than fairy tales. The fate of the future primarily depends on the way we live now. We absolutely have to change. Only the delusional dare to declare that climate change is not a real issue for today. The simple truth is that our only planet B is a failed planet A. And so ends the entry readings from Miss Khadija Haradi from 2018 to 2020. I don't know about you, but I do believe that 2020's entry was the best out of all of them. If you think so, please let us know, of course, in the comments on Facebook and in the comment section on YouTube. Please let us know, let us know what you think. Now, of course, it is my intention that you not only listen and watch and hear for the ceremony, it is also my intention that you support. We have a website that we have established so that persons who miss this ceremony, like is happening this morning, for whatever reason, maybe there are other you know, events happening right now. And if you miss this, we have established a website that you can visit and watch these students' entries. We had them recorded with Calabash TV. Thank you so much for sponsoring that for us. And you can see the entries of all of our participants and winners from the year 2018 all the way down to 2020. Of course, for last year's competition participants, we were not able to do so due to the pandemic. So you can see how much this pandemic has affected our students, but it doesn't mean that it has silenced them. I would like you to continue to support these students and especially for this year's competition, I really am challenging the Ministry of Education. I am challenging the principals of all schools on this island. I am challenging the teachers that teach English and literature. I am challenging the parents I'm challenging guardians. I'm challenging you students. Please participate in the 2022 competition. Participate in any other writing competition that allows you to express yourself and express the challenges that we face. Allow your voices to be heard. The 2022 competition will launch during Commonwealth week 
that is the week of the 14th of March in 2022, and will close at the end of June. I am the competition promoter here in St. Lucia as a Royal Commonwealth Society associate, and we will let you know when the new topics and new theme have been posted. You will be able to find them on the Slaterra Facebook page, as well as the website. Please follow, please watch, please support, please encourage, and of course, let us not silence our students. Their voices must be heard. Thank you so very much. Malika, are you there? Yes, I am. Hello? Malika, we can't see you. Malika, we can't see you. What? Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you, but we cannot see you. Why is the start of the video camera? Please see like another video camera. What? I have one video camera. <laughs> Okay. So with, while uh, my colleague is sorting out, um, while she's sorting out her issue, um, I will go ahead. So again, this was the fourth annual St. Lucia Queen's Commonwealth Essay Writers Awards for the year 2022. We are very happy and glad to have collaborated with the St. Lucia Nobel Laureate Festival Committee especially on the theme for this year, which was celebrating excellence, facing new realities, creating new modalities. The festival is being held from the 10th to the 31st of January, 2022. Of course, our event is just one of the many, many, many events on the calendar for the St. Lucian Nobel Laureate Committee. And I encourage each and every one of you St. Lucians to watch and of course follow all of the events that are taking place during this festival. Thank you so very much to our partner, Songtree, Ms. Paulina Marie. Thank you so very much to the government of St. Lucia. Thank you to Computer World, to Ms. Alicia Velaspolius, to Mitchell Series Writing, and of course, Slatera. Thank you for allowing this to be possible. Thank you to the students for taking time out of their classwork, because their school today, to attend this ceremony in order for you to be recognized and for persons to hear your readings. Thank you for joining. Thank you to the teachers for allowing the, the students to join us and the principals as well. Thank you to the parents for being so accommodating to allow your student to be part of this ceremony. So I will just give um, Ms. Polina Maria of Songtree a moment to say her final remarks before we call this ceremony to a close. Ms. Marie. Okay, I would just like to say that I am very, very elated that the students have been able to express themselves by reading their entries, some of which give me, gave me goosebumps. I want to continue students, citizens of St. Russia, to continue to take part in these competitions, especially the Royal Queen's Commonwealth Essay Competition, as you are able to express yourself and so the world will hear your voices on the different modalities that we face, on the challenges that we face, and to also know that you produce a great genius within you, that powers that will help you as you journey on. Thank you to Slatera, thank you to our sponsors and those who are listening, especially the parents and all the students out there. Please 
please I admonish you to let your voices be heard. Young people, you are the future. I thank you. Thank you very much, Miss Marie, for those final remarks. And with that, you have it, ladies and gentlemen. And this concludes our ceremony for this morning. Thank you so much for bearing patience with us, those of you who are watching via Facebook on the Slatera social media page, as well as the St. Lucia Nobel Laureate Festival social media page, and those of you watching via YouTube channel on Slatera. We ask that you please like and follow these pages um, for updates on other events happening during the festival. Also regarding the competition and the ceremony, we host a ceremony every year in January during the Nobel Laureate um, Festival of Activities. So next year, God willing, we will be having the fifth annual ceremony and we're hoping to have a lot more participants in that ceremony. So again, I would just like to call out the names of our 2021 St. Lucia Queens Commonwealth essay writers. When you see them, please give them a round of applause and please, of course, encourage them to keep writing. I am speaking of Miss Azoya Howell of the SDA Academy, Miss Latoya Marie of the Babano Secondary School, Miss Ayana Paul of the Leon Hess Secondary School, and finally, but not but not least, Miss Shanessa Joseph of the Viewfort Secondary School. Congratulations to all of you. Thank you once again for joining us. My name is Michelle Honeywell. I am one of the competition judges for the competition, as well as the founder of Slaterra, the host of this ceremony. We would like to thank you for watching and enjoy the rest of the morning. Good day.